hello, hello, hello. It's about to go on, it's on, hi. Welcome, 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 it's so wonderful to see you. Happy Wednesday and welcome to the Jerome L. Green Performance Space, also known as the Green Space. And we like to tell people that we channel the collective genius of New York City to create forward thinking, live art, theater, and journalism that sparks change. Whose first time is now? Hey, 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 hey! But I'm excited, because y'all been here before. Can you raise your hand so I can really make sure that I understand? Thank you, good to see you. You know that we're part of WNYC and WQXR. We are the live on stage and on screen part of this company. So please sign up for our newsletter. Go to our website, www.thegreenspace.org. On July 12th, we have an amazing 50th anniversary of hip hop program happening that's gonna be moderated by music journalist Clover Hope. And we're about to announce all the guests for that, which is gonna be super exciting. So stay tuned to our events and tomorrow, you can come, but I'll tell you, tomorrow, because <laughs> it's sold out. Um, but if you had our newsletter, you'd have bought a ticket. So it's Radio Lab Live mixtape. It's gonna be an immersive sound experience with Simon Adler from Radio Lab Live, right here tomorrow. I don't know, maybe we'll let you through the back. You can stand up, I don't know. But it's good to see you. So without further ado, we know why we're here. This is very exciting. We're all very excited. I'm going to turn it over. So please join me in welcoming Hannah Lincoln Hoker and Tara Cole from JSSK. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I want to thank WNYC, New York Public Radio. Um, we, uh, we're JSSK. Um, we're an entertainment law firm. We represent Alana, but more importantly, in addition to representing artists, part of our mission is to uh, really build um, a program around community and around important issues that are important both to our clients and to our country. So this is something that we're really excited to be a part of. We're really honored to be here, and we're so glad you could join us. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Hannah Lincoln Hoker. I'm the Chief Engagement Officer at JSSK. Um, and, you know, we just really believe in doing this work in a meaningful way and facilitating important conversations, but also walking the walk and trying to save our democracy. Um, so we're really thrilled um, to bring together Alana um, and AG Holder and their organizations, um, organizations that we support and really believe in, who are fighting for democracy on the front lines. NDRC is an incredible organization that you're going to hear more about tonight. Um, and the Generator Collective that Alana and her co-founder, Glennis, are running um, to engage young people, millennial and Gen Z voters in our democracy. Just couldn't be more important. So we're thrilled to support them, thrilled to have you all here. and going to stop talking and let them share their incredible work. Where are they? <laughs> Alana. Do, 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 do. There she is. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Hey tonight. there. Come on, folks. What's happening? How you doing? How's it going? Okay. There we go. Let's have some fun. Um, oh, I guess. I, well, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I could. Well, well, I'm not sure where the mic was. Okay. Yeah, okay, right cool. In front of me. So, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, uh, at Generator, you know, I just have so many questions because I find the system of government to be purposely elusive. And I feel like, am I unintelligent? Um, because I don't know it, but I think it's made purposely elusive. Um, so we like to hold space for not knowing, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to do that. So it's always an honor to get to talk to you. To ask you questions directly, it's such a privilege. So thank you. Always good to hang out with you, too, as well. It's yeah. always fun, and I think... Uh Usually enlightening. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, we try to hit some notes. Yeah, um, yeah. So the last time that we were um, working together in, in person was March 4th, 2020. And right before something happened. Some big right? thing, something some happened. big sort yeah. of event. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was so, it was such a pre COVID event. Yeah. Uh, Generator uh, hosts dance parties where we create cheat <laughs> sheets for upcoming elections. And you were, literally getting down, literally getting down, <laughs> dancing his ass off in DC on stage. L I'll never forget, he goes, Bill Barr can't do this. We were, <laughs> and there's like a 1980s kid in play. Oh, 
wild, wild. Was I right? <laughs> yeah, you, you, uh, that Bill was... Bill Barr could do a lot of things I didn't do, but uh -huh. I could certainly... Well, that's, another, that's right. That's a whole other story. Yeah, he definitely is not someone who can dance well. Uh, that's, that's clear. Uh, that's a vibe thing. Um, so, you know, since COVID hit, I think that the general public's understanding of how policy and government affects their day to day <laughs> became in right. razor, you know, razor sharp focus from vaccines to who before COVID was checking the CDC website, like right. Right. what? <laughs> Zero people. Um, so I'm curious how uh, that aspect of COVID has affected your work, how the public uh, might understand, um, you, 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 have an, you lead an army of um, lawyers suing unconstitutional gerrymandering mm -hmm. around the country every day. So, so give it up for A.G. Eric Holder. And we'll get to the NDRC, but I'm curious how the past few years has um, changed the public perception of your work. You know, it's interesting. I, I think that um, people have a greater sense um, of the power of government, the ability of government, and what government should be able to yeah. do as a result of the, uh, the pandemic experience. Now, that has been a dividing line. You know, there have been some who said government has done too much, but I think the, the greater number of people in this country have said that, you know, um, the ability of government to you know, get vaccines, get vaccines out to people, yes. um, get information to people to try to wrestle with this once in a century um, crisis has shown, you know, the, the power of government. There's been so much over the course of the, you know, since, since Ra the Reagan years that government is bad, government is not good, you know, that uh, the worst thing in the world is, you know, hear the, somebody from the government say, here, I'm here to help you. And I, I think the pandemic has shown that that's not in fact um, the case. Um, there's a lot that can be done um, through government. And if our system is fair, the government is us, you know? Right, uh, right. If our system is fair, if we are right. having elections that really represent the will of the people, that puts in place people who are um, acting in a way that's consistent with the desires of, of, of the voters, um, we are, in fact, um, the government. That's right. That's right, ideally. Um, so let's talk about the NDRC. Yeah. You were attorney general under President Obama. A long time ago in a galaxy far away. <laughs> Worlds away. Yeah. And um, when you left government, you you founded this organization, the National uh, National Democratic Redistricting yeah. Committee. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what catalyzed you to form this organization? Well, as Barack and I, well, I'm sorry, as President Obama and I, <laughs> uh, what the heck, as Barack and I were looking back over um, our time in government and trying to figure out what is it that we wanted to continue to do um, in our post-government careers, we really identified gerrymandering as, as a problem that really um, inhibited his ability to do all the things that he wanted to try to get done. I think history is going to be very kind, I think, to Barack Obama, but I think there's still stuff that was left um, undone. And gerrymandering, you know, that is putting in place people um, who don't necessarily have the support of all of the people. If you look at a gerrymandered state like Wisconsin, um, you know, Democrats have won over 50% of the vote in like three of the last, I don't know, six, seven cycles, and never had more than 30, 35% of the representation in the ah. Wisconsin state legislature. And that's all as a result of the way mm. in which the, um, the lines were drawn. And as a result, you have a legislature that does things inconsistent with the desires of the people. And that is something that we saw a as well. We had to deal with a gerrymandered House of Representatives, and that prevented a lot of the bills, a lot of the things that the president wanted to get done um, from being accomplished. And so we said, let's, let's, focus, let's focus on that. If we can get things right in the state legislatures, we get things right in the House of Representatives, it's a, a democracy-enhancing thing. Mm. Um, you know, this is basic, but can, can you just lay out how gerrymandering is racist? Yeah, there's a, 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 there's a distinct correlation between um, racism and, um, and gerrymandering, because we always bring, break down gerrymandering to two things, partisan gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering. Mm, mm. Um, and r partisan gerrymandering means that you're trying to get your party um, you know, an advantage, and you're trying to identify you know, where the Republicans, where the Democrats, and you draw lines to try to um, exclude them on that basis. Racial gerrymandering is um, a little more pernicious, a little more uh, worrisome, where you're identifying people by race and saying, all right, we don't want black folks to have all the power that they should have. You know, the Supreme Court just decided a case coming out of Alabama where they said, you know what? What the uh, Republican Alabama legislature, state legislature did was to draw lines in such a way that it disenfranchised, diluted mm -hmm. the power 
of black people in um, Alabama. And that is inconsistent with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You've got to go back and um, redraw the lines. And we have seen through history um, that connection between disempowering, coming up with different ways to disempower communities of color, not the least of which is through um, the problem of uh, racial, racial gerrymandering. Um, okay, two questions off of this Alabama case. So that was, um, speaking of inconsistency, inconsistently humane of the Supreme Court? Right. Yes. What? Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like what? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I get exactly where you're coming from. That was a case where it was a case that, you know, we were involved in. It's our case. So we had the law. We had the facts. Wait, hold on. Their case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm just saying. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> That's cool. Don't, don't, yeah, yeah. don't skip over that. Yeah, cool. let's not skip over that. Cool. Um, but again, we had the facts. We had the law. We had precedent on our side. So, you know, that should have been, from my perspective, a nine-zip case, you know, mm. nine, nine to zero. Um, but I have to be honest. I was shocked that we won the case, 5-4. Um, I was surprised oh by the fact Lord. that we actually won the, won the case because this Supreme Court has not really been friendly to um, voting rights advocates. Yeah. And, and from my perspective, to, uh, you know, to our, our democracy, starting yeah. back in 2013, it's 10 years now, a case called Shelby County versus mm -hmm. Holder, um, that, holder. Yeah. Hold up. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm that. I'm the holder, right? Yeah. Wow. So that's so all my friends it. know that we only call that the Shelby County case. Uh -huh. we, never, we, never, we, never, we never say Shelby County versus Holder. But that really kind of, mm. uh, really kind of gutted in a substantial way the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that led to, you know, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, the closing of about 1,700 polling places around the country, oh my disproportionately God. in communities of color. Uh, a huge surge in voter purges disproportionately in communities of color. Again, so much of this stuff is connected to and wound up all in, in race. Um, right. And so uh, to get this Supreme Court to say, you know what, Republican legislature in Alabama, you're disenfranchising, you're diluting the power of African Americans in your state. You need to redraw all of the lines in the state legislature in the, in, in, with regard to the congressional delegation um, was consistent with all the measures that we normally apply to how a case ought to be decided, but a little inconsistent with the way in which this court yeah. has conducted itself over the last few years. So I was pleasantly surprised. Do you, do you think, why do you think it was such a, a healthy outcome? Because I think they ran into facts and law mm, that they simply mm. couldn't, um, couldn't ignore. Mm. And I, I think also, you know, a lot of the, there's a lot of blowback that the Supreme Court right. is now dealing with right. as a result of the Dobbs decision overturning right. Roe versus Wade, the issues that they're having around um, ethics. Uh, you know, at some level, right. you know, they're, they're human beings and, um, I said at some level, um, they're some human level. beings. And so they're trying to, you know, I, I, I think there's, they had to react to that in some ways. But again, the, the decision was totally consistent with the law, the facts, and, right. and precedent. And 5-4, like you said, it's five, not 9-0. Not yeah. So, um, okay, I have one other follow-up question. You know, you, you separated the gerrymandering into, like, racial gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. It feels like very overlapped, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question that there's overlap. I mean, you know, African Americans are overwhelmingly uh, Democratic in terms of how they vote. Um, Hispanics vote largely Democratic, not to the same extent that African Americans do. Uh, Asian Americans, same way. Um, and so it's in some way, there's, there's a congruence between um, partisan gerrymandering and, and racial gerrymandering. If you want to, if you say, I'm just, and you, it actually happened in, in a couple of states where in, in North Carolina people have said, oh, we, we weren't doing anything to black folk. We were just trying to disenfranchise Democrats. Right. You know, as, right. as, it's like, wait a minute, that's the, your best argument? Right. But the reality is if you're doing that, you're also having a negative impact on um, people of color. They, mm. they, they, tend to go, they tend to go together. Right. My instinct would be to just reduce it to it being the same fight, yeah. but I guess uh, now I see why. Yeah, lawyers being see. lawyers, we know we always right. want to cut things and dice things, right. slice and dice things, and so, yeah. Um, so we're 10-year um, sad anniversary coming up on the uh, Shelby County case, mm -hmm. and one-year sad anniversary. I learned that term from the activist Raquel Willis. One-year sad anniversary on the Dobbs ruling. Right. So as a voter, I feel so helpless when it comes to these Supreme Court cases, and I don't know how to close this gap, but I'm wondering if I'm hoping you can kind of close it for me. Is there any hope as a voter? Is there any influence I can have 
over these Supreme Court cases? You see, we underestimate the power that we have as ordinary citizens. You know, I've had a lot of titles. Um, you know, I was a judge, I was a deputy attorney general, I was a U.S. attorney, I was attorney general. I have the most powerful title right now um, that I've ever had, and that's citizen. Mm. Citizen. Uh, we're concerned about the power of the Supreme Court, and we ought to be concerned about the Supreme Court. It's doing things that I think are, in a lot of ways, lawless, inconsistent with precedent, um, inconsistent with the way in which judges are supposed to, um, you know, measure cases. But the reality is they are only dealing with things that are brought to the court, usually as a result of something that has happened in a state. A state legislature has done something that gets presented to the Supreme Court, or the federal government has done something that gets presented to the Supreme Court. And so our power is, the superpower that we have, is to decide who is actually in these state legislatures, who's actually mm -hmm. in Congress. That controls the flow of the things that actually gets to the uh, Supreme Court. Now, I have some Supreme Court reforms that um, happen to be in my book here, oh. um, are, are in finished March, um, where I think you know we need to expand the court. We need to deal with the fact mm. that two Supreme Court seats were stolen um, by the Republicans in, in Congress. Um, but again, as regular citizens, and again, that's a powerful, powerful title to have, and it comes with responsibilities. Mm. It means that we have to be engaged, we have to be involved, um, we have to vote. You know, more than um, that's that's like you know the primary thing. Right. But we have the capacity to decide. You know, who is in our state legislatures, who is in Congress, and that really decides. You know, what issues get presented to the um, to the to the Supreme Court. Mm. When did this book come out? Um, a year ago. It's now out in paperback. Oh, wow. came out in paperback uh, earlier this month. Love it. Congratulations. Yeah. So um, reproductive rights, we were just talking back backstage, yeah. is what gets a lot of people out of bed to vote. Yep. And democracy feels like a less, um, a, a little more abstract. Right. Uh, are you finding the conversation changing around that? I, I feel like younger voters get it more and see how it, it connects to all the um, policies that are, affect our daily life. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. You know, when I get out there and talk about um, the, the impact of gerrymandering um, and the negative impact it has on our mm. democracy, people are kind of like, oh, okay. But then I say, all right, here's the deal. If you care about a woman's right to choose, right. if you care about gun safety, uh, if you care about climate, uh, if you care about criminal justice reform, all of those things are directly tied to gerrymandering, who serves in state legislatures, who serves um, in Congress. And that's how we've been able to hook people, to get mm. people involved in the work that we're doing in this fight against um, gerrymandering. So I think you're right. Um, I, I think that the Supreme Court in the in Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe versus Wade, has awakened a sleeping giant. Right. Um, that people in this country are saying, you know what? We're not going to let you dictate to us, um, women in particular, but men also. I mean, right. you've got to understand, this is, this is a people issue. This is, you know, it primarily affects women, you know, most directly. But a as a man, um, I am concerned about this because it's a liberty issue, right. you know? Right, right. Uh, I'm also the father of, of two girls, and I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that they have fewer rights at their age than their mother did when she was the right. same age, you know? Right. It's kind of like... That's not the way this country is supposed mm. to is supposed to go. But they've awakened a sleeping giant. Um, I was campaigning in Wisconsin for a, a woman who's running for a Wisconsin state supreme court yes. seat, and one of the primary movers there was um, the whole question of abortion because of the Dobbs decision. The Wisconsin rule it, law with regard to abortion goes back to one that was passed in 1849. That's right. And uh, I remember campaigning and saying, you know, 1849, women couldn't vote. Um, people like me couldn't vote. Uh, and that should be the, the law that governs reproductive rights in this state. And in a state that is 50-50, this judge won by 11%. Mm. And that was, I think, largely because of uh, a focus on reproductive rights right. and the state of democracy um, in Wisconsin. They are they're intertwined. Right, right. I, um, the midterms gave me so much hope how young mm. people turned out. Yep. And Gen Z and Millennials combined are the biggest voting bloc in American history ever. There is huge power um, that young people have that I'm not sure they have understood to date that they do have, that they do possess. And to the extent that uh, young people are concerned about you know, the state of this country, if young people voted in the same proportion that baby boomers did, right. 
they would have far more power than baby boomers do because they are the biggest, that's the biggest voting block now um, in the country. And so not to put too much, you know, pressure, responsibility on, on young folks, but, you know, you can control the destiny, the direction of, right. this, uh, of this nation, and it's your future that that's is right. most, uh, that is, you know, most at stake. Who do you find you reach in your, like, general American audience? Are young people listening? Is it mostly baby boomers? Who's, who's getting it? You know, I, I think that um, virtually nobody was getting it when we started six years ago. Mm. Um, but now I think people generally are starting to get it. And it's because, as I said earlier, um, you, you break it down. If you talk about kind of gerrymandering um, and you leave it kind of ethereal, Nobody really gets right, it, but right. when you start talking about, uh, again, a woman's right to choose, um, that brings a certain cohort um, into the mix. When you start talking about, uh, you know, gun safety, that brings a certain right. cohort. And so you start to build, you know, coalitions, different cohorts that come together, all of whom are concerned um, with their issue. And when you say, you know what, if you care about your issue, you've got to care about the state of our democracy. And uh, a, a central part of having a healthy democracy is the elimination of political and um, racial gerrymandering. And that's what brings um, people along. And so I think we're reaching, I think we're reaching all of these, these folks, not to the degree that uh, I would hope, um, especially among young people. You know, uh, young people are, are still, you know, I, I remember, I was young once, um, I, I remember that, you know, I, I wasn't as focused as I am now on, um, you know, the functioning of government. But uh, the time is short. Uh, we're at a crisis now when it comes to, to climate, uh, when it comes to reproductive rights. And um, we've got to stop this slide into, uh, I think, these negative areas, you know, really, really quickly. And so young people, those are the ones that I, I really try to focus on, try to hone my messages uh, towards, uh, try to show that I'm more conversant with their culture than perhaps I actually am, you know? Because, like, young people are talking about the daily, the daily stuff. Yeah. on the internet and I don't think that I mean we you know what I mean not I'm youngish um, but uh, you know we are not necessarily connecting it to policy that's kind of what generator is like understanding mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day. Right. Um, I, I mean especially gun violence the fact that kids are are terrorized in schools by this I mean that's the yeah. the worst and most salient See, and that's why I think the work of generator is so important because that you have a way in which you know I'm, I'm 72 years old and so um, my you are this, uh, this is why I love her. This is why I love her. I love her. Um, uh, and oh, so, you oh. know, I'm like, you know, I'm like the Supremes, the Temptations, you know, like, you know, <laughs> Motown, let's do this thing. Yeah. Um, you know. Let's do this thing. Truly, let's do this thing. Right. And so. Honestly, because, because I think, I do think that young people so have the capacity to get it. We hold so much complexity and younger than me. I mean, when I say young people, I mean younger than me, holding complexities, this nuance that we didn't have in public discourse when I was growing up, mm -hmm. um, young people have today. And, and um, culture is so democratized that I think that brings me hope because I think that um, young people are sort of governing themselves culturally. And the cultural turnover is so quick. Right. Um, and I, I, you know, there's such toxicity about social media, but I, I find that um, the good stuff rises above it and people connect over these social justice issues. And if you study our history, it's always been young people who have led movements of social change. I mean, if you go back to actually the revolution, uh, you, you think about all the people, wow. the founding fathers, they were all young. Benjamin Franklin was the only guy. He's like, you know, probably like my age, or maybe a little younger. Um, but all the other ones were like in their 20s and, and, and 30s. Oh my God. If you look at the suffragettes, again, predominantly women who are, who are extremely young, you think about the civil rights movement of the 50s and yeah. the 60s. Young people, I mean, Martin, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, these people, they were young people. Yeah. Diane Nash, unbelievably young. The anti-war movement that actually ended the Vietnam War, predominantly led by, um, by young right, people. Right. And so young people need to understand there is a historical basis to believe that they have power mm. that they need to exercise and that can have an impact on the direction of the nation. History teaches us that. That's a great campaign. I can see that, right? Like having, ah. Uh, Young, hot, cool actors, you know what I mean? Like, just, I mean, that I see those commercials. That's brilliant. And I'll be the wizened old guy, uh -huh. you know? You play Ben Franklin. Oh, okay. my God. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, we'll have wigs, we'll have, you know, a suit, padding, all that, but all right. uh, that's funny. Um, oh, that's so inspiring. Um,
So the NDRC, based on the NDRC's analysis, 75% of states have fair maps, which actually is mm -hmm. um, uh, heartening. Right. Um, Substantially higher than it was after the last cycle in 2011. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is, that's, uh, that gives me um, hope. And 25% of states that don't, how do you prioritize? How do you strategize? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, those numbers, you know, 75%, it was like maybe 53, 54% using traditional measures before you'd say we're fair. Now we've gotten it up to 75%, which sounds like mm. pretty good. But that means that 25% of the states or, or the seats are not fair. Uh, right. And that could be a pretty substantial number. The New York Times did a uh, a survey and said this is the fairest redistricting cycle that we've had in the last 40 years. I mean, so sad, and so sad that one out three out of four, or one out of four being unfair is hopeful to me. We have such low right. standards, right. you know, so right. that's, you're, you're, yeah. And so you look at, uh, well, where are the places there that you have um, unfair maps? And they are predominantly places where you see um, Republican trifecta control, governorship mm -hmm. and then both houses of the legislature. Um, Texas, Georgia, Florida. Oh, God. Um, you know, those are the places, oh, Ohio. It hurts. Place, these are the places where you, you find that, that 25%. And so, yeah, it's great that NDRC has had the impact of raising that number from 50 to 75, fairest, real, fairest um, redistricting in the last 40 years. Wow. But there's still an awful lot of work um, to do. We've got to protect, you know, that which we have already done. We've got to make sure that we continue on this road. Uh, there's still reforms that we need to put in place. And one of the things is that, you know, I've said and that Barack has said is that we're going to stick with this over the course of this decade. Right. You know, we're not going to say, hey, good job, Eric, you know, go off and do whatever you do. No, I'm going to stay with the NDRC through the course of, of this decade to make sure that we get ready for the next redistricting cycle in 2031. I mean, we've got to play the long game here. Right, You know, right. I think progressives, Democrats, this is something that we don't necessarily do as well as um, our, our Republican counterparts. That's right. And so I'm going to stay involved, focus on the long game, um, and make sure that we're ready not only for 2031, but that between now and 2031, we do all that we can mm. to make sure that we protect that which we have um, already done and try to make, you know, reforms and progress before we even get to the next um, redistricting yes. cycle. Yes, yeah. I think, um, I think that young activists, you know, you, you were saying like for the cycles, but it's a lifelong pursuit. It's right. a lifelong practice and a lifelong party to join. It's right. like really fun yeah. work. and. You know, it's kind of like I'm not into sports, you know what I mean? So, like, to see change happen in real time, I'm like, right. this is cool, you know? Um, but, you know, the point you just made, I think, is an important one and, and something that people need to understand. There's joy yes. in this work. Yes. You know, there's joy in this work. Um, it's not easy. I mean, everybody's got, you know, business lives, academic lives, you've got a personal life. And I'm asking you to grasp, you know, to, to uh, put on to that um, a, a civic component to your life. And it might be difficult to do, at, at, you know, to find the time, but I'm going to tell you, if you do it, you're going to feel better about yourself over the course of that week as you look back. The nation is right. going to be better for your involvement in it. And you think about um, the civil rights movement. Um, I saw it from the outside as a relatively young person, but the joy that, um, that I felt in seeing, you know, these barriers knocked out. An American apartheid was destroyed as a result of the right. civil rights movement. The nation was fundamentally changed. The women's movement fundamentally changed this nation. And there was joy in the work, in the interaction with people of like minds, um, working on a, a, on a common goal to, to make the nation better, to make the nation more fair, to make it more just. There's joy. There's joy in that. When you're celebrating that, I mean, like we, Generator, we literally hold da dance parties, but like it is a party. And when you're cel celebrating a win like that, it's right. it's so much deeper. You, I mean, really do dance so much harder. Right. It's so meaningful to your bones. Uh, we, um, we hosted a conversation, Generator, with Gloria Steinem mm -hmm. uh, here in the space. And I asked her like, you know, I was like, how do you do it? How do you do the work that you do? And she literally like sits back and she's like, it's so fun. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I yeah. see. It's so, it's so fun. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's a reframing that can happen and is happening because it is. It's a blast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you're in, you're in the trenches. Um, you know, little things will happen. It'll make you laugh. Um, there's, there's, there's satisfaction in accomplishing Ooh, the gossip? something. The gossip. I mean, that you know, is hot. Right, you know? Gossip. That is yeah. meaningful yeah. and yeah. consequential. Yeah. yeah. There's Ooh. all kinds of, there's all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. And at the end of the day, <laughs> the notion that you have been engaged in um, a worthwhile activity um, to make the, the world better, 
I mean, what yeah. greater joy is there th than that? You and know? you can like brag to your kids, like I'm such right. a good parent. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. That's fun. Exactly. That's cool. Exactly what I do. Um, <laughs> so NDRC, uh, the last couple questions, NDRC has a new strategy of protect, prevent, and propel. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about this vision and, and how this changes, or if it does change your approach thus far. Yeah, it's actually a, a continuation of the strategy that we've had. Um, the protect part means we're trying to protect the gains that we have put in place. When mm. we started NDRC, mm. we didn't have much to protect. We were in the process of trying to wow. accomplish things. And now, so we wow. now have that um, ability. Um, and propel means that, you know, we're looking ahead. Um, mm -hmm. you, you can't do democracy some of the time, you know? Um, you can't be involved in this work every now yeah. and again. You got to be there all the time, as I was saying before. You got to play um, the long game. If it's you a want, practice. Yeah. If you want democracy, you got to do um, mm -hmm. democracy. And so that's what you know our, our, our strategy is is all about. You know, let's protect the gains that we have made. Let's continue the work um, between now and the next cycle. Um, let's prepare this nation for you know what it can and um, and should be. You know, I'm pretty optimistic about this. You know, um, the that book that I wrote really kind of chronicles how you know various groups of people did impossible things. You know, I mean. These young people, young black people in, in the South, with, with white allies, as I said, destroyed a system of American apartheid. I mean, I'm sure that Dr. King at some point must have said, can we really do this? Mm. You know, John Lewis, can we really do this? Diane Nash, can we really do this? And yet they changed the nation. Women, you know, early part of the 20th century. We, we assume now that women would always have the right to, no, I mean, women were beaten. I mean, you know, not mm. the way, as they were marching in 2013 down uh, the streets of Washington, D.C. They weren't cat calls and, and booze. They were beaten mm. as they marched down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and yet, they persevered, they won, mm. and they changed the nation. And so um, that's why I'm optimistic. I look Your back, history gives you hope. Yeah, that's, that's the foundation. That's the, the, the foundation for my, um, nice. for my optimism. Um, what is something, you know, um, this work, related to this work or otherwise, maybe not related to this work, what's giving you joy these days and just helps you Relax. Well, certainly not the New York Knicks. Um, uh -huh. But uh, <laughs> I was born and raised here in New York, and hmm, that's not going to, that's not necessarily been, been a joy. But, you know, it's um, the arts, you know, um, nice. movies, um, you know, television has, has, I think, elevated itself. Yeah. You know, um, you see big stars doing really, I think, really interesting stuff on, on television to a degree that you maybe you didn't see before. Movies are lots of animated stuff, and uh, that's great for, you know, if you like that, I, I, I love you for it. Um, but uh, things that are a little, maybe a little more serious, a little more uh, in-depth. Like uh, what? Hmm? Like what? What have you watched that you Well, like? I mean, you know, um, I just finished watching the, the Diplomat. I thought that was good. Nice. I, I we like love that. The Diplomat. I like that. We love. Although we love. always she was always disheveled, and I was thinking, no, no ambassador would actually walk <laughs> around, you know, <laughs> looking looking like that. Gritty. You know, yeah. Nice. Um, and then you know, I I'll, I'll cycle through um, old shows, you know, Sopranos, The Wire. Yeah, I mean, nice. you know, these are old. Oh, dark. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> this is all the stuff. I mean, and so, nice. um, and then you know, I'll I, I'll just do kind of you know easy take it easy kind of stuff. Firefly Lane. Uh, this is something you know I'm just I don't I'm not telling everybody, <laughs> sh but, but I, I kind of like that. Show. Love you it. Know, it's kind of you know these Love two it. women and following them. You know what what's going on in their lives. Um, Love it. That's uh. Yeah, things, things like that. That's, it's it. a good way to kind of get away from, um, you know, the world that it sometimes seems a little foreboding um, and uh, to be involved with the creativity that yeah. people can bring to the arts is something that I think is uh, really cool. That's, I love to hear it. We, we love to know. So. Mm -hmm. um, so now we'll open up for questions. Iconic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fully iconic. Um, and here's a, a mic, Henry. Thank you. I have two questions. First... Do Democrats sometimes gerrymander as well? Oof, that is such a good question. I need to just make space for that being a great question. <laughs> um, okay, and then second question. Second question is, what keeps you going? We've gone to 75%, that's a great improvement, but what makes you still here after all this time, still working on a specific issue? You, how old are you? <laughs> Nine. Not, no. that's somebody, this, this is like an 80-year-old in that. I mean, this, this, is, this is a plant here. This is not a child. We are, you, that is, your questions are giving us hope. 
That's amazing. Thank you for those questions. Incredible. But, so uh, I really want to know that first one. Right. Because I really want to know that first one. Do Democrats ever gerrymander? Yeah. I mean, historically, um, we have seen gerrymandering been done by both parties. Um, gerrymandering goes back actually to the founding of the Republic. Wow. Um, when really? Pat yeah. Patrick Henry, um, <sighs> this is again all in that book. Patrick Henry, um, you know, one of the founding fathers, give me, give me liberty, give me death. He didn't, uh, his, the, the Jameses, James Madison and James Monroe, he didn't like one or the other, I forget which one. And he drew lines in such a way that um, he made sure that the James that he didn't like uh, didn't win. I'm sorry, what a baby. <laughs> right? Right. So okay, this okay, is Patrick yeah, Henry. Right. And so, yeah, Democrats have certainly um, gerrymandered. But what happened in 2010, in the 2010 2011 cycle, was something fundamentally different from that which happened um, before. Princeton University did a study and said it was the worst gerrymandering of the past half century. The use of computers to understand not how, how neighborhoods would generally vote, but to look at particular houses and figure out, well, we've got oh. five residents, we know four are going to be Democrats, one's going to be Republican, through you know, the use of computer databases that you could really draw the lines with a greater degree of precision. And so Yikes. Republicans took advantage of that in 2011 when Democrats were not nearly as technologically proficient. Mm. And so, but yes, but historically, Democrats have done it. Um, but now you don't see Democrats doing it nearly as much. And at the NDRC, we've always said, look, we're not here to, to, to uh, gerrymander right. for Democrats. We just want the system to be fair. Right. If it's fair, Democrats will do just fine. We'll, right. Progressives will do just fine. Just make it fair. Make it a contest of um, ideas and candidates as opposed to who's best at drawing the lines. Right. And we'll do, uh, we'll do just fine. Right. That was a great question. What was the second one? What? Keep, go ahead. And <laughs> the second question. Whoa. Whoa. Wow. It was James you, you, Monroe. You sit up here. <laughs> it was James Monroe. He was the first president to only serve four years compared to all the others who did the max number of terms. So but the second wow. question. Wow, I went to public school on Long Island. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Okay, wow. <clears throat> Whoa, Henry. Whoa. Okay, Thanks. second question. Henry, Thanks. you are the man, okay? <laughs> yeah. So the second question was, what keeps you going after all this time? You've done this for 70... To, we've gone to... Sev <laughs> we've, got, we've gone to 75%. You've been working for a while now, but... What, but what's... But what keeps you still going for all this? Like, almost like, why are you not, like, on vacation? Yeah. Why do seen all the stuff with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and be like, that's my new cause. I'm just going to work mm, on that mm, now. Mm. You're still committed to this specific thing yeah. or problem that we need to solve. Yeah. Right. So what draws you to this and why are you still here? Basically? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, one thing I will say this, you know, my concern about the overturning of Roe versus Wade, uh, I see is tied inextricably to the problem of gerrymandering. Right. You know, Roe versus Wade gets overturned, and then that means it goes back to state legislatures to decide what's the, the law in a particular state. And you see these gerrymandered mm, state legislatures mm. doing things that are inconsistent with the desires of the people in right. that state. They'll pass these really draconian um, anti-choice laws that have no exceptions, mm -mm. Um, and they do so knowing that it's not supported generally by the people of the state, but they're in these safe seats, these gerrymandered seats, and they'll suffer no political consequence. Um, so, right. yeah, that's what I, I tie those two together, and that's what keeps me going there. But more generally, um, you know, I grew up in the 60s. Um, you'll read about these. Uh, I grew up, well, you've probably already read about them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I grew up in, in the 60s at a time when um, this nation was in a period of really stark transformation. Uh, I'm of West Indian extraction, and I saw Caribbean nations gaining their independence. I saw mm. black people getting... Um, the rights to which they were entitled, finally getting the ability to decide their own fates. And that stuck with me, that notion mm. that um, you know, change is possible, change has to occur, justice is something that we should fight for. Um, and I'm as optimistic and in, engaged now at 72 as I was when I was um, 22. You know, optimism wow. isn't something that is a function, or involvement is not a something that's a function only of young people. People, they say, you know, as you get older, you get more conservative, you get less mm. involved. Uh, don't buy into that. Yeah. Don't buy into that. You know, you, know, you, you stay involved. You stay focused. Um, you stay 
concerned about the state of our of our country um, and stay open Th that's like that's exactly. an obvious thing i think about your vibe is open and open to hearing from people sure. <laughs> who aren't you sure. you know yeah. i think that's uh that's something that keeps people um progressive as they get older yeah i mean stay open to new ideas new things um you know i still think supremes and temptations are better than you know what's going on in terms of music now but but hey yeah you know on the other hand i i came part way you know i love biggie um i love tupac yeah. you know and so although i was talking to an associate at my law firm and i said you know i was trying to show how cool i was and i said yeah i like tupac biggie um nas and she said to me oh you like classic hip-hop <laughs> <laughs> and i was like really so you know all right um yeah oh hey jeff go for it Hello. Hey. Hi. A.G. Holder. Alana. Hi. So I love that you call abortion rights and the fight for abortion rights the gateway drug for mm. um, gerrymandering. I love that. So what is our gateway drug to actually get people to show up and vote? Because it's so sad as a country that we have all these rights, but that people aren't actually going and like exercising them all the time. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the gateway drug? But you know, it's interesting, I think that's right. We have a lot of rights in this country and we assume that we have these rights because we exercise them and we just think, all right, this is just kind of what being an American means. But when you take away a right, yeah. it's like, whoa, what are you doing? And that's the significance of the Dobbs decision. That's the first time the Supreme Court has ever taken a, a right away from the American people. Now, you know, the Supreme Court has, is, uh, is a pretty conservative institution, you know, it's kind of just the nature of it. It is not, people think of the Supreme Court as kind of the, the Warren Court, that's kind of, but the Warren Court was just a brief period in time. If you look at the history of the Supreme Court, it's done some really awful things, you know. Um, but taking away a right, I think, has mobilized people, engaged people. Um, I saw it, as I said, in, in that campaign in Wisconsin, um, you know, talking about reproductive rights, talking about abortion, got people to the polls in substantial numbers, young people especially, young people um, especially. And I think that um, that Dobbs decision is going to play out in the elections in 23. This is an off year, so there's still a couple of elections, you know, not big stuff, but in 24, um, <laughs> the Republicans, conservatives, the, the pro-life folks are going to have to go to the American people on a national late level. Um, Senate races, House races, the presidency, and say that we want to take away from you, from the women of this country uh, and, and, and the men who support them, um, we're going to take away from you your ability to decide how you control your body. Make that argument and, and think you're going to win. And I may I add, I actually um, want to add that I think it's culture that is the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. This shit happens and it's happening all the time, but it's the culture that makes it something to take in and chew on and activate it is that that is the gateway drug to me there's a um one of my favorite activists paola mendoza once um at another generator live um uh talk was talking about the cycle from activism to culture to policy it is culture it is talking about it online it is political messaging it is dance parties it is young people talking that's culture to me it is music it's it's making the connection but i think I mean, I, I'm a comedian, so I'm, I'm here for the culture. Like, I mean, that to me is the piece that connects it all and makes it um, human, you know? Because uh, there's been uh, anti-human rights policy. I mean, that's what founded this country. That's how this country was able to be built on the bodies of black people. It is the culture that has risen the consciousness about it. So, you know, I... I um, yeah, I think it's it's the conversation around it and the arts, as you say. But th and I think what you said is really important. It is the culture and those people who are directors of our culture, people like you, um, artists, um, can play, I think, a really important role in moving the nation, persuading people. Um, you know, I can make all kinds of interesting, I hope, legal arguments and, you know, talk about history. And that gets a substantial number of people. Um, but boy, if you engage artists and the culture and merge those yes. two together, yes. we become almost an unstoppable force. And it, that has grown over time. We started, um, I started uh, with Glennis, uh, started mm -hmm. co founded Generator um, activating and organizing right. in 2016. And it was like kind of weird to ask artists to speak up right. about something right. and think about how that's grown, you know? And like, 
some people are sometimes like, vote, and it's like, okay. And then sometimes people are like, vote for whoever, or, you know, anti-choice is totally whack, and that's better. But, I mean, just, you know, th that has grown, and that, that brings me hope to see that it's cool to care. Um, dealer's you're, choice. You're picking. You're, you're. <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for two more. I'm going to ask uh, from this person here. Yeah, there's this Hi. online oh. component here. Yeah. Uh, first What's I'll online mean? Okay. <laughs> first, I'll say that canvassing door to door in Pennsylvania is a very joyous experience, and I'd recommend it to anybody. Yes. I met a lot awesome. of interesting people and had a lot of great experiences, including with some Republicans who yep. were very nice, who were actually very open to what cool. I was doing. But anyway, uh, my question is along the line of what you just talked about: Can an 81-year-old man mobilize young people to vote next year in big numbers? Are you 81? <laughs> I'm not, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, alone? No. I don't, uh, personally, I mean, I'm just asking my opinion. I don't think uh, Gen Z and millennials are thrilled to vote for an octogenarian, to be honest. But, for example, with Generator. Oh, I, I, mis I yeah, didn't understand yeah, yeah. the question. Yeah, me too. Got, I was okay, like, okay, I got you're it. not now 81? I got it. Now, no, now 100%. I, got it. I know. Okay. I'm a little slow here. Okay, I got it. But, you know, I think that conversations are happening. For example, Generator is a political messaging machine. One of our messages was in 2020, I'm not stoked, but I'm down to vote for Biden. We're going to continue that messaging. I, I think that the conversation, Gen Z and millennials can handle the nuance, and we're grown-ups, you know? Are we like, go Joe, <laughs> you know? I don't know. But, um, but I think that young people are motivated to create the world that they want to live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as the president says, you know, th th there's going to be a choice. Uh, and so That's right. th the question's going to be, all right, maybe you'd like to have Joe Biden, you know, younger, but, you know, he, he, let's look at the record. Let's look at what he will have done um, by then with regard to a whole range right. of, of, That's of right. issues. That's right. Uh, and let's consider who he'll be running against, uh, whether it's Trump or anybody else who's running for the yeah. Republican nomination, and think about where they're going to take the country and the future that they will have um, for um, for young young people. So yeah, it's, one uh, word on that. Yikes. Yeah, So. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it should be pretty pretty clear. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Um, let's have uh, one more. Um, I also have two questions. First, H.G. E. Holder, why did you not say Broad City when yeah. <laughs> presented oh, the opportunity? Oh, <laughs> to, um, that you watched. Uh, I don't know. Why I, did I not do what? Say Broad City, Fireflies and Sopranos, oh, but I Broad City. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, LOL. I, need, I just didn't hear. <laughs> okay, and uh, question two. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you... Like, there's been a lot of conversation about reforming the Supreme Court in some way, um, and I was wondering how you feel about mm. that and if you suggest any reforms. Yeah, um, again, the book. Um, I mm. talk about reforming the Supreme Court uh, and saying that, first off, we have to have term limits. Um, that, you know, yes. the, this notion of having Jeez. people serve on the court for 40 years um, in an unelected position with that much power, not a good Psycho. thing. And so I say... We should have 18-year uh, term limits. You should serve on the court I only mean, for... I mean, you're pushing it. It's ten, six, eight. It's a lot. I think 18 is enough. That, that insulates them from well, politics and all that. Well, I am. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting because, as I point out, um, this is something that the Chief Justice and I, maybe the only thing that we agree on, um, in a speech he said that there ought to be 15-year um, term limits. So 18-year okay. term limits. But here's another one that I say. All right, you should have a, a system whereby a president appoints a new justice in the first year of his or her term and the third year of his or her term. And if you do that, every, every president would have two, year, with two justices per, um, per term. Mm. And if you have 18 years, the court will expand in the short term. But over time, the court will get back down to nine justices. <laughs> Um, but I, so I think that we need to kind of depressurize the selection yeah. process, depressurize the confirmation process, um, and I think you could do that by, as I said, first year, third year of a term, you mm. automatically pick um, a Supreme Court justice and then limit their um, time on the court to, uh, to 18 years. Let's just do your plan. I think that sounds great. I've got a plan. Yeah, I've let's got just a plan. do that one. Um, okay, well, that is all we have time for, correct? So um, this has been so illuminating. Sure. You're so brilliant. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much, A.G. Eric Holder. Thank you. Um, thank you guys so much for your time and your presence. And 
Stay safe out there. Bye. All right.